All right. OK, hello, everybody. Welcome to those of you who've come. I see that we're still getting some additional people in. Um, you know how it is with with virtual meetings now. We're all super used to clicking on the button and when it takes a minute or two, uh, people feel like they're late, but that's no problem. I'll just get started with some housekeeping things. First of all, I'd like to note that this meeting will be recorded. As per standard practice, we will be providing a copy of the recording later, along with all the presentations that have been made for reference. This, uh, this meeting has the facility for people to pose questions in the question and answers. We will be taking a look at the questions, releasing those, um, and we're gonna try to do live answers to the greatest degree possible as we normally do. Um, in this case, uh, if there are questions we can't answer, we'll answer them later, but at the afterwards, we will circulate, as I mentioned, the recording, the transcript, the PowerPoints, uh, the Q&A as answered, and um, we'll make sure that any unanswered questions are answered. We'll be doing a couple polls again. Um, some of them are questions you've seen before. It's just interesting to see the evolution of the responses over time. So there'll be a couple polls as an icebreaker. We'll also have a question about uh, the summer party that we're planning on having. And then at the very end, there's a survey about this town hall. It's only three questions. So if you have a chance afterwards, do please answer it. We use the information from the, that survey to adjust uh, some of us have different ideas. I always like to pack town halls like Christmas turkeys with tons of information. We've learned from the feedback that's not always the best approach. So we do appreciate you taking the time. It should only be a minute or two to respond. We'll keep the poll open through um, Friday. We are agenda. Next slide, please. So here you can see the agenda. We're uh, the opening remarks. That's my mem. We're doing that right now. We will have an introduction from the Ombudsman's office, and we're very fortunate to have the Ombudsman um, Nicholas with us. He'll also be introducing a new colleague. We'll have a presentation from the Human Resources legal team that will talk to us about responsibilities as an international civil servant, and that will also include social media. You know, given what's going on in the world right now, um, it's a particularly contentious and difficult time. Uh, it's important, I, I felt it was really important to help remind everybody what the UN expects. Um, and there'll be some, some practical examples. And again, if you have questions, if you have particular questions that you want answered, you can pose that in the chat. My advice on anything like that, if you have doubts, either don't, or if you have doubts, ask. Please ask and check. It's always better to have somebody tell you this is a problem and that isn't, so you can um, nuance your response, as opposed to doing something and getting negative feedback and having to deal with the fallout. And as we'll hear, of course, some of the things that we do um, are more public than we think, and that fallout can go far beyond us personally. Then we'll have, and I think this is the main dish, a uh, presentation on the SHP moves and transitions. These are going to be impacting everybody in DCM. I just want to caution people that this is the, it's construction is a process, as a friend of mine says, um, and the situation with the SHP has been complicated, as is everyone's lives have been, with COVID and now the impact of the global supply chain difficulties. Uh, so this is also having some impact on SHP and its construction program. We will hear from Ted and Casey, and thank you very much for joining us, um, a bit about where, what the planning is, what the time frame is, but it will be a pretty high level discussion. And the idea is to give you a sense of what's coming and how best to react to that. Um, so I think that's enough from me. Again, thank you very much. I see we have 174 attendees, so that's really very much appreciated. So I'll go ahead and let's take a look at the polls. So this, I think, is supposed to turn into a word cloud. One of the things that's funny about the polls is that if we roll the slide to the next slide, it closes the poll. So we're going to leave this here a little bit. Um, so if you just have a second, uh, click on the, you know, how to, you know how it works. Take your phone, show it the QR code. It'll pull up the poll, and maybe you can just drop in a line or two about what your highlight has been since the new year. Um, so we're almost, we were a, a third of the way through the year. The first four months of the year are over. Um, so we'll, I think there's been a lot that's going on. I would say for me, one of the highlights has just been the incredible spring weather we had in March. Uh, it's a little, not so much now, but just with the lovely flavor, uh, flowers, etc. So Antigone, when you're ready, I think we can go on to the next one. This one is much quicker, um, not a free question. 
So we, we asked this previously, and the idea is just to get a sense of how things are evolving. How do people feel things are changing? Um, personal well-being, and again, this is a big question. Just do your best. Um, just pick something and then after that we'll go ahead and get right into the presentation one thing i'd like to note is that uh the ombudsman's office is going to have to leave at 1400 so if you have questions for them during the presentation please pop them into the chat and someone from their team will try to answer them right away otherwise we'll get answers to you after the fact so enough for me let me hand it over to ombudsman office thank you very much for joining us Um, thank you, Kira, and thank you, colleagues from uh, DCM. Um, my name is Nicholas Dautokatos, and I'm the Regional Ombudsman uh, for UNOMS, and I'd like to just quickly present the, the Geneva team. Uh, those of you who um, are familiar with our office know that historically we've been a two-person office, and in the last few months, we've grown to a four-person office. And, and Sadia uh, ben Maklouf has recently joined us in January. Uh, Sadia has a lot of experience uh, with uh, the practice of being an ombudsman. She was with the ombudsman's office at UNHCR right across the way. And we're really delighted to have Sadia joining us. And we also have a consultant conflict resolution officer uh, who's providing support to our team, Elizabeth Meritz. Unfortunately, Elizabeth is on holiday today and she wasn't, she's not able to join us. And then many of you who've contacted the office know Debbie and Debbie makes sure that the office is running smoothly and effectively. So the, these are the four of us. Maybe I can uh, give the floor just briefly to Sadia to um, to just say hello and introduce herself, and then we can continue with our presentation. Thank Sadia. you very much. Thanks, Nicholas, for the introduction. I'm delighted to be here. Bonjour, uh, tout le monde. Et j'aimerais aussi dire que je parle français. Donc, uh, voilà, je suis heureuse d'être parmi parmi vous aujourd'hui. Great. Thank you, Sadia. So we'll be spending a few minutes introducing our office to you. Um, I'll do a few slides and then Sadia will do a few slides. And one of the things that I really wanted to share with you is the conflict positive philosophy of our office. Now, that may sound like both a mouthful and a little bit confusing, but I, I wanted to explain it to you. And this is something that Elizabeth and I uh, once put together for a presentation, trying to capture the essence of our office. And, and one of the things that I've discovered as a conflict resolution uh, professional is that many um, conflict resolution professionals have a tendency to be conflict avoidant. And you know, I know that even though I'm a lawyer by training and in my professional practice as a lawyer, I was quite adversarial. I noticed that in my personal life, I had a tendency to avoid conflict. Um, and one of the things that we would like to try to stress in our practice is that, you know, conflict is actually not only risky, but sometimes it poses an opportunity and that through disagreement and discord, there's an opportunity to understand, you know, our counterparts, our family, our colleagues a little better. What are their needs and interests? What are their um you know, what, what is really important to them. And, and so we do really see conflict as something that is inevitable, but that if it's managed productively, actually can, can yield better results, uh, better understanding and closer working relationships. And, and so that's one of the things that, um, that we want to emphasize. And I see the poll has the, the slideshow has disappeared for a second, and I was just about to ask to proceed to the next slide. Great, thank you, Antigoni. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So our office is really based on four principles. One is the principle of confidentiality, right? In order for us, for, for people who visit our office to feel comfortable visiting us, we really do need to keep uh, the confidentiality of what is said. So we don't share 
um, who has come to see us or what they've said without the explicit permission of the people who've come to visit us. So sometimes people give us permission to share something with others, but the presumption is if they don't, then we will keep that, that whatever the discussion was confidential. We're also impartial, so we're not necessarily advocates for staff, nor are we instruments of management either. And, and by maintaining that equidistance between everyone who comes to see us, that actually allows us um, to provide people with helpful, useful guidance about how to tackle some of the sticky issues that are presented in the workplace. We're an informal resource, so you know we usually get involved in cases before uh, they go to the MEU or the UNDP, and usually once a formal case is filed, our, our, our intervention diminishes, although sometimes you know, mediations might continue to go on uh, uh, pending uh, the filing of an MEU or a UNDT case. And we're independent. So um, we like to say we're about as outside as insiders can be. And, and I think this, this notion of independence, even though we're based here in Geneva, we report directly to the Ombudsman in New York who reports to the General Assembly. So we have a knowledge of the dynamics of the institutions that we serve, but we're not beholden to any one entity. And so with these four principles, this really allows us to provide many of the services that Sadia in just a minute will be describing to you. So um, we'll uh, let me pass over to Sadia and she can continue with the presentation. And again, as Kira said, we'll we need to leave at two o'clock. And if people have questions, you, you can either contact us directly or post something in the chat right now and we'll be we'll see if we can answer them. So thank you and over to you, Sadia. Thank you, Nicholas. And um, if I may ask to go to the next slide, please. So the, the idea here is just to inform you about our services, but also what we can and what we cannot do as an office. And most likely when someone approaches us, what we do the most is listen to, to the concerns that the staff members uh, bring forward and we help them analyze the situation and see it perhaps from a different perspective. We can probe, we can use different um, conflict management skills. And, um, and of course, we help the, the colleagues identify possible options to resolve the issue that uh, they're bringing forward. Um, and during that whole process, we can support in, in pursuing a resolution. A resolution may not happen overnight, so this usually colleagues reach out to us uh, when things have escalated, when the issues are quite complex, so it may take some time and we, we're, we're happy to follow up throughout. And, and what we try to do the most is really to empower the colleagues through some counseling and conflict coaching so that they can um, cultivate, they can, they can have more uh, capacity than build their capacities to deal with conflict if it arises again in the future. Of course, if it's appropriate, we also suggest and, um, and facilitate mediations or just dialogues between two parties when, when the conversations between them become challenging. And the other thing we could do is to suggest appropriate referrals if we uh, assess that the case needs to be um, dealt with by another entity. Next slide, please. And what we don't do is to breach confidentiality uh, as such, which means we're not going to contact anyone unless we have the explicit consent of the person who's approaching our office. So the confidentiality uh, extends to our office, but under no circumstance we can talk to an external or to the other party without having the permission of, of the, the visitor. Um, we cannot and we do not have the authority to change or make any substantive changes to managerial decisions. However, we can make recommendations while talking to one or the other party. Um, and as Nicholas said, we, as an impartial entity, we do not advocate for, for a person, for a party to a conflict, but instead we would advocate for fair processes and 
for upholding the values of our organization. Um, and we do not conduct or participate in formal investigations. That's also part of our informality principle. And lastly, we do not keep any records uh, of our notes or appear in any formal proceedings. Next slide, please. So the kind of services we offer, you probably have guessed based on what we do and what we do not do. Um, it's usually an, what we call an option generating discussion or conversation when uh, when a colleague reaches out to us for the first time, we hear them out and we we try to think together about the possible uh, routes that they, they could take to resolve informally their uh, the issue at stake. We make referrals, we do what we call conflict coaching. This is not coaching colleagues to, to get into conflicts, but to get them out and through conflicts. So it's really conflict management skills. Um, we do what we call shuttle diplomacy, where we place ourselves in a position of a messenger. So we would convey messages from one party to the other when conflicts are escalated, when communication has stopped between two parties, for instance. This is um, this then becomes our role to convey the messages um, and to help them restore communication. We do mediations as well at the request of the parties, but it's important to keep in mind that mediation is voluntary. Um, so both parties have to agree to it before we could move forward with that. We could also do group processes or what we call team interventions when uh, that's needed and required. Um, there is also a component of our work that focuses a lot of, on, on outreach and capacity building. Um, so we, we see what are the needs of our different um, stakeholders and based on also the trends that we're seeing, because we are identifying the systemic issues that may arise, we are um, uh, training or providing some material to build the capacities within the different teams uh, to address the issues that come to our attention. And of course, um, at, at probably Nicholas level or even higher, there is uh, some sort of feedback happening uh, at the ombudsman uh, level and the directors or uh, the chiefs, etc., to, to give them generalized and anonymized feedback about the trends we're seeing and some recommendations about um, the, the the way forward and our possible collaboration. And lastly, we do um, input to policies and procedures and initiatives that come to our attention. So this is in a nutshell the, the role and the work of the Ombuds Office. So we will post in the chat our contact information and please know that you can reach out to, to us, to Nicholas, myself or Elizabeth our colleague who's um, who's a coach by nature and who's supporting us in our role. Um, if you have any work related grievances or issue, we would be more happy to, to help you and we can do so in different languages. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us and also to ask us any questions uh, you may have after hearing the presentation. Thank you. Over from my side and maybe we can go to the last slide which only has the contact information. Thank you very much. And and I see that there are a few questions uh, already in the question and answers, and, and so maybe we can go through them. So we have one colleague who's, who says that honest disagreement is often a good sign of progress, uh, quoting Mahatma Gandhi. And the question is, would you qualify staff and managers who sought so far your mediation as having the minimum necessary for your uh, endeavors? And I would imagine that that question is, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, are people who engage in mediation ready for the mediation? Um, and I, I guess, you know, one of the things that we do prior to the beginning of a mediation is we, we try to take the opportunity to listen to um, each side uh, separately before we bring the two sides together. And we do, you know, we do explore with them, you know, what are they expecting from the, the mediation? What, you know, what are their aspirations to participate in this process? And we also describe the process to them, right? Are they, are they ready for it? So um, based on that, we get a sense of whether or not, you know, mediation is the appropriate forum to, to handle any particular issue. 
Um, one of the things, because of our confidentiality and impartiality, we will never actually say that the mediation didn't start because one of the parties or it failed because one of the parties. We usually just say that the, you know, the mediation wasn't appropriate in, in, at this particular time. So I'm not sure if that answers the, the question from the, from the colleague who posed it, but we're happy to talk about this more um, a little later on. Uh, I see that someone also has asked, I would like to know what types of issues that we could approach the Ombudsman for and how serious issue has to be before reaching out. What I would usually say is that if the person who has the issue is a staff member or even you know, a consultant or an intern, they can bring an issue with us. It has to be work related in some way. So the nexus is, is you know, there's a very minimum threshold. And one of the things that I think is really important is that even seemingly small issues, if left over time, can grow into big issues. And so we would never say that, you know, the issue has to be really serious before coming to see us. I think one of the, the value of our office is because of our impartiality and our confidentiality, you know, we're a good sounding board to discuss issues with. And, you know, when I think back along my, uh, of my practice, some of the most successful interventions that I've had is that one 45 minute meeting where someone perhaps is, is plagued by a particular issue and, and by coming to speak to us, they have a better idea about how to move forward in a way that perhaps, you know, reduces the likelihood of the conflict escalating. And, and those are the things that, you know, no one sees except, you know, the, the person who's come to see us and, and ourselves. And, you know, and I really feel that, you know, we've we've contributed to the the peace and harmony of the of the the office for that day. So I, I see I think those are the only two questions right now, but let me also ask Sadia if she would like to supplement any of my answers. Sadia, over to you. Thank you, Nicholas. Just on the last question uh, regarding the type of issues that uh, colleagues could approach us with, I think we have a, a category list of 73 issues or so. So it goes from uh, admin to, uh, you know, uh, perceived uh, misconduct in terms of abuse of authority, relation, relationship issues, peer to peer, etc. But the only thing I wanted to add is just more of an advice than anything else, but it's really to try and contact us and reach out to us at the first signs of conflicts or even tensions. I think this is when and where we are most effective um, and when we could really uh, equip you with the tools of uh, dealing with the situation, addressing it from the onset, rather than when it's too late, when emotions fester, when conflicts escalate and then perhaps other actions are, are needed. So that's it from my side. Thank you. So that's it for, for our presentation. I, I hope we've given you a sense of not only the spirit of our office, but the, some of the things that we do and don't do. You've now had a chance to at least see us on the screen. And, you know, and if you want to reach out either to Sadia or to myself, um, you can always do that directly through an email or you can contact Debbie and she can help set up an appointment. And yeah, and we really appreciate you taking the time to listen to us speak. And and I, I you know, again, if you have any questions that we haven't answered, we would be happy to do it offline. So I, I think with that, we'll pass the floor uh, back to Kira and we'll um, we'll bid you a good afternoon in, a, in just a moment. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nicholas and Sadia. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to share that with us. Um, I myself, early on, when my career at the UN, had a, a reason to work with the Ombudsman, and it was a really, really positive experience. And ever since then, whenever people have had issues or tensions, I always suggest people start with the Ombudsman office because it can be such a, a valuable, positive experience taking something that is difficult and stressful and moving it into a new direction. So thank you very much, Nicholas Sadia, for taking time. And I know we'll be working with you in the future. Great. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you for the invitation. Bye-bye.
So now we'll switch over to uh, Bettina and Bettina Gerber and Jérôme Blanchard from um, HRMS. Yes. Bettina, Jérôme, you have the floor. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Shira. Hi, hello, everyone. So my name is Jérôme Blanchard and I'm here with Bettina Gerber. So we both like legal officer in HRMS and we also like the conduct and discipline focal point for you for you not. So the conduct and discipline focal points are staff member designated by the head of entity to provide advice and support on matters relating to conduct and disciplines. So the role is defined in the STSGB on 2019-8 on addressing discrimination, harassment, including sexual harassment and abuse of authority. So in our role as legal officer in HRMS and as conduct and discipline focal point, we'll present you today your obligations. Oh, I think I think you're going too fast, Antigone, for the slide, but that's fine. <laughs> so we will present you today your obligation as staff member when expressing your personal views on entirely on social media and provide you with guidelines to help you to navigate this difficult topic successfully. So I will present the, the three first slides and then after Bettina, the next three one. So we will also provide you with links to the document we mentioned. So at least you have the guidelines and you have everything. And please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A a chat and we'll try to to respond to you as soon as possible. So so now yeah so the, so the the next slide is already here. Now I think you you can, can you go back uh, Antigone to the yes perfect. So basically like the staff rules and regulation 1.2 define the duties and obligation of staff members. So under 1.2 staff members must conduct, conduct themselves at all time in a manner befitting the statute as international civil servants and avoid any actions and in particular any kind of public pronouncement that may adversely reflect on the statute or on the integrity, independence and impartiality that they are required by that statute. So this does not mean that staff members are not allowed to express their opinions when talking to the press, using social media and other outlets or when engaging in political activities. On the contrary, the UN respects the inviolability of staff members' personal views and conviction, as well as a right of free number of expression. So staff members must respect several principles and rules when engaging in such activities. So this is what we're gonna we're gonna see. We're gonna see that. So one of the questions we, we may ask is like, you know, based on that reading of staff regulation 1.2. Would that be acceptable for a UN official to make statement that may adversely reflect on his or impartiality at a private dinner party with UN colleagues attending? I don't know. Maybe you you can you can put your answer in the chat. If we can we can have a small discussion on that. And also maybe another point which is important to do to 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 know is like even if you indicate that you make a statement in your private capacity or that the view expressed are your own, you have to be careful because your behavior is not exempt from the impartiality and conduct required and befitting of an international civil servant. So basically the fact that you say in your private capacity or that the view expressed are my own is not a carte blanche to say anything you want to say. You know. So maybe I'm, I'm going to just copy into the chat box. This is the this is the link to the staff regulation and rules, so I think that so I'm trying to copy the link. I think everybody knows the staff rules and regulation, but um, maybe you can have a look at one one point two. And maybe we can we can go to the next slide, please, Antigone. Thanks. So the tact, discretion, care, and good judgment. This is what we would expect from international civil servants. So we have a media guidelines for United Nations officials. So the most important things that we have to really stress about is like the principal voice of the organization is the secretary general. And as a matter of principle, every member of the secretary may speak to the press, but within limits. So under the rules, prior authorization is required to issue statement to the press, radio or other agencies of public information if related to the purpose, activities or interests of the United Nations. So we do have this STAI on outside activities that is really important because it really set out the rules on what you should do if you intend to speak to the press or even what you should do if you intend to have any kind of like outside of occupation. So if you have any doubts, you can first also look at this STAI, which is very important. 
So you speak only within your, your area of competence and responsibilities, and you provide facts, not opinions or comments. And of course, you, we really expect you to leave sensitive issues to the official who are specifically authorized to speak on them, like the spokesperson or head of departments. So a, a small question will be, if a new and official speaks to a journalist, may or she speaks off the record, and what does this mean? So basically, like if you speak to the press, you don't you don't speak off the record because first you have no guarantees that it's going to be off the record. That's for sure. And so but sometimes though, like officials specifically authorized to address sensitive issues can give a journalist a deeper understanding on, of an issues by speaking on background. However, it's very important that the journalist knows on which the following basis the conversation is being conducted. On the record, you know, like everything I say can be attributed to me by name, not for attribution. So basically on background, don't attribute this to me by my name, but rather to a UN officials. Or on deep background is like you can use my ideas, but not my words and don't attribute them to anyone. But this is really for officials specifically authorized to address these kind of sensitive issues. You know, like it will it really for the spokesperson head of departments. So to summarize, you only speak on record and you left the other thing and the sensitive issue to specialists. So if you really want to speak, if you if you have like a, um, a request, you know, to speak to the press, you need to request prior authorization based on the STI 2000 slash 13 that I'm going to put in the chat. And I'm also going to put in the chat the media guidelines. Also, that I think this is really important. So this is the media guidelines, the first one that I sent. And then after this is the uh, STAI on. No, sorry, that's the same. I'm going to put in the chat right, right after that, the, um, the, uh, the STAI on, on outside. OK, so this is here I am. OK, so now I'm going to give the floor to Bettina. And if you have uh, any question, please don't hesitate. We'll try to. So this is the STAI on outside activation and employments. Thank you very much, Bettina. I leave the floor to you. Ah, and this there is. Can you give an example of a non prohibited expression of personal political view? So I would not say something about prohibited, you know, so what we'll, we'll see maybe also like a little bit after that about the. Um, about the like a political exception. OK, so I'm, I'm just going to try to reach out to Bettina because. Bettina is not connected, OK. So we have like a little issue here. So it's not a question of being prohibited or non-prohibited. So we will see later on, like in the next, next slide, what it means, you know, like what kind of what kind of political activities, you know, like is being authorized, you know, like and what is not being authorized. So basically what, what we'll see is not a question of like a, a political expression that is authorized or not authorized, but what I can say is like, of course, you know, like if it's within the, the UN standard and you know, it's really like in line of the charter, it, it's nothing prohibited, that's for sure. And it's it's also about like what kind of like demonstration you should go, you can go, right? We, the, the ethics office had these kind of questions, you know, like when they were like protests in the US, you know, like after the death of George Floyd, all of these kind of things, you know, like what you can do, in which demonstration you can go, right? So. It will really depends on on the type of the demonstration. It will depend on the case by case basis. Of course, you do not go there as you an official as well. So it it's it really depends. Also, you have to look into the. Ah, so Bettina is here. So this is something. This is this is a really good question, and we will go. We will see that in more details in the next slide. Bettina, do, are you here? Yes. Can yes. I give you the floor? Ah, perfect. Thanks, Bettina. Antigone, I think you can you can move to the next slide. OK. Yes.
I'm I'm sorry. Yes, I'm here. Can okay. Thank you. Excuse me, please, for this uh, for this uh, mishap and for the confusion. Thank you very much, Kira and uh, Jerome. So yes, okay. Thank you. I will speak about the personal use of social media, which also requires. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Bettina. I'm sorry, I still have a problem here because I always hear my voice and I hear everything what was said before. I don't know how I can change this. Well, maybe in the interest of time, we could. Yes. Um, yeah, we're not hearing the echo. I'm sure it's annoying when you hear the echo okay. as well, but uh, but we're just hearing you. It's fine. OK, perfect. Thanks. Thank you, Kira. So staff are encouraged to promote a better understanding of the objectives and work of the organization through social media. And to advocate for its ideas, principles and values. However, activity on personal social media, even when unrelated to official duties, may expose the United Nations to reputational risks. Therefore, some important principles are they to remember so it think before posting and use common sense the good idea is to always ask is a comment which i would like to post can this be made to the media or at a public event if you feel that this is not really the case then it's better not to post it nothing on social media is private even if you have the strictest privacy uh, um restriction privacy settings on but uh, nevertheless it's not private and you should always ensure that what you post is consistent with how you wish to present yourself to the public even if it is not stated publicly on social media that you work for the united nations your status as a un staff member is not private and it can be very easily found out by a simple Google research. Be always mindful of sharing and liking posts from other accounts, because if you like a post from someone, diff uh, from someone, it means that you endorse the statement or the opinion. So the question is, may I post a photo of my colleague on my private LinkedIn account? What do you think? Maybe you can just put yes or no in the chat. So it is possible to do so, but you have to respect the privacy rights of colleagues, partners and beneficiaries. Do not post information or images of colleagues in a personal capacity without their express permission. So you always need to ensure that you have the consent of the person of whom you wish to post the photo. The next slide, please, Antigone. So now speaking about the guidance on political activities, it's a very recent one from 2022. So our personal participation in any political activity must be consistent with and may not reflect adversely upon the independence and impartiality of our stages. And there are several permitted political activities, for example, voting, party membership, discussing pot political views privately. However, there are also some activities which are not permitted such as standing as a candidate for or holding political office, representing a government, or publicly criticizing or trying to discredit the government. Engagement in any political activity requires the exercise of good judgment, as well as tact and discretion. Questions that come up quite often are whether it is allowed to be 
a member in a political party which is, for example, openly xenophobic. xenophobic. This is not allowed because it is not consistent with the standards and the values of the UN. Another question which comes up often is the participation in demonstrations. In, in particular, when there are events which really, yeah, which have a huge impact worldwide, for example, the election of Donald Trump at the time or the murder of George Floyd. In this context, these questions came up very often whether it is allowed to, to participate in demonstrations. And usually the ethics office provides detailed advice on, on these questions and often sends out specific advice whenever such an event shakes the world. And this brings me to the last slide. Here you see further resources. So whenever you have questions on conduct and related questions, you can contact Shimom or me. But you may also contact the ethics office at headquarters and you do see the details on the slide. We will not able to answer all questions but we then will also refer to the ethics office because the ethics office has the ultimate authority on these topics to stay informed or find resources to share it's always good to follow the social media accounts of the un and of un geneva and as well to have a look at the speeches of the un secretary general which may also be a very helpful resource to guide you what you can post, for example, on social media and what you can't post. Thank you very much. And I will have a look at the chat if there are questions. Yes, we, we do have a lot of questions, actually. We have a lot of questions, <laughs> <Yes>. okay. <laughs> Yeah, if I could, I think this is this has been very helpful, um, but I think it would be good. I think if you could go through some of the questions, it would be worth it. This is this is really provoked a lot of uh, perfectly reasonable questions. And uh, I have to say personally, I'm very grateful for this um, yes. because this this is something that, you know, we all need to hear again and again because it's very easy to forget this. Um, so I think I, I as I said, I'm very grateful. But if you could take a look at some of the questions in particular, um, I think, Jerome, you already spoke a bit to the question, can you give an example of non-prohibited expression of personal political views? But um, so there, there's a yes, question yeah. about, let me, let me just quickly, was this item put on the agenda because there have been recent incidents? Well, let me, yeah, there have been some things that have been concerning. Um, and this is the reason why we felt it was important to provide this information generally. Um, one in question one is, is something having to do with social media um, and i know social media is really tricky and i see the next question um, below and i'll pass that on in a minute um, and then the other was a, a where somebody made some statements in public okay so um, but it is important to do the feel my feeling on this is important to give people as much information up front as possible and again this is where i'm going to reiterate if you aren't sure don't post it don't say it or ask somebody up front. Um, and so now that I've said that, here we have this chance to ask two very knowledgeable somebodies. So maybe Jerome, you could take the next question from Hassan, um, who makes a comment about the social media and that this slide was a bit ambiguous. So I don't know, so, maybe so, you could try to sort of square this circle, thanks. Okay, so so yes, I, I'm gonna try to look at all of the questions. So we, we do, uh, so will the UN provide us with a list of things we are allowed to say for each issues? Uh, of course not, you know, like we're not going to give you a guide. However, as we say in the in last slides, like speeches of the of the secretary generals or UN official social media accounts, you know, like provide you with like the official the official position of the organization, and maybe also you can find resources to share. And and of course, you know, like there there will be no problem to share and to retweet or you know like to to re, to to share this this kind of this kind of positions. But of course, you know, like we're not going to give like a list of um, 
of a statement to say to the social media or to anyone for each of the topics. Um, but but really, it's really give you like um, I think like a lot of resources. You know, if you if you also follow uh, the the official social media account of UN, be it headquarters or in Geneva. Uh, maybe um, Bettina, you you have something to add on on that one? Um, okay. Okay, can you can you all hear me? I, yes, I really do have trouble because basically everything is recorded and I hear everything twice. So I hear the person speaking in real time and I hear what was said before. So well, I, th I think I think what might be best maybe is given the difficulties you're having with the sound. Maybe we just I mean, I hope you don't mind, but maybe Jerome, you could just address this because I think it, it's obviously frustrating, I think, for you, Bettina, and, and the sound quality from our side is, is not ideal, actually. Okay. So I so if that if that's OK, my apologies. Yes, I will leave and try to reconnect. Now. OK, so I'm, I'm going to continue. So we then after we have questions on peaceful gathering across the street from the Russian mission in Geneva. So uh, the, so that I will really find you the the official position of the ethics office on, on that thing, on your participation to to get to to manifestation. You know, uh, let me let me find out. I'm going to put that in the chat as well, because it's a, it's also very it's also very tricky. You know, it's like you had um, you know, like if you know, we we had like staff member when I was in New York going and, and going for um, for manifestation against the election of Trump. You know, they were not Americans and everything. So it, it of course poses like a problem of neutrality. You know, uh, because you like you're basically protesting against an elected government. You know, it's not even your country and your your UN staff member. So you know, it's really like as Kia said. And if you have any kind of doubt, you know, you should not do it. Um, for for this um, for this situation, you know, of course, we have like a really clear position uh, from the SG uh, about that issue. Uh, I think it has been repeated as well, also like in Geneva. So, um, um, if you attend as your personal capacity, I, I will I will also really remind you to be very mindful. Okay, just like I'm just getting getting like something from Bettina is trying to reconnect. Just sorry for this. Um, uh, for this little uh, technical thing. So let me find the article on the uh, from the ethics office. And also maybe one one thing that is really important to know in this kind of situation is like. The ethics office will provide you with a confidential advice, you know, like we will provide you with some advice if we get like all of course all of the information possible. Um, but if if we have any doubts and in case of doubt, we will also contact the ethics office, you know, and I think um, and, and I think this is also important to know that we also go to the ethics office when we have a very difficult question. And in that case, we we do have some uh, good questions here as well. So we may also go to the ethics office. So can I give a recommendation to colleagues on on LinkedIn? Yet I, I yes, you can you can go because if you give a recommendation on a colleague, it's on, on request, I guess, right? So if a colleague will request you to a recommendation, I think you have all the right to give him or, him or her recommendations. Um, bonjour, accueillir une famille ukrainienne chez soi est-il considéré comme un geste politique prohibé lorsque l'on travaille pour les Nations Unies? Euh, non, 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 absolument pas. Euh, la seule chose qu'on va vous demander dans ces cas-là, c'est de bien respecter les lois du pays hôte. Voilà, que vous soyez pas euh, en porte à faux et que parce que vous avez une, une obligation de respecter les, euh, les, les lois, les lois locales. Donc, il faut, il faut effectivement enregistrer les personnes qui vont venir habiter chez vous et faire en sorte que vous respectez bien toutes les procédures. Donc, le fait d'accueillir quelqu'un ne sera jamais considéré comme une activité prohibée ou une activité politique, politique prohibée. Euh, donc, Jérôme, pardon, oui. I'm there yes. now, <laughs> in ah, the works, bien, so parfait. I can take some questions as well. Okay, très bien. Thank Volontaire. you. So, is participation in a peaceful protest considered public criticism of government? It depends. It really depends. It can be. So, to be careful with this, um, I would definitely advise you to to ask um, before you join a peaceful protest, because also a peaceful protest can be a public criticism of um, a particular government. 
Um, your question is simple. Ours are complex, but you seem to answer philosophically. We want clear, tangible examples from 2022, not from old media standards. Tact and discretion in the US is different from tact and discretion in Saudi Arabia. That is why more precision is needed. Thank you. Well, um, of course, different are, standards are different in different countries, but what we don't apply a standard of a particular country at the UN. We apply our standards and values, and we need to be sure that whatever we post or say does not conflict with our status of an international civil servant and is in line with the values the organization stands for. If I could just leap in yep. here again, Bettina, this is I mean, I, I totally get this question, this point, but this is again where we circle back to asking in advance because many there's many nuances to these questions. Um, and one of the advantages of asking a professional um, is that they will understand perhaps things that you weren't aware might be an issue. So ideally, they'll ask you follow up questions to tease out any of the things and then they'll give you guidance. I know that it's frustrating, but if I recall, Jerome, Bettina, maybe you could share with us, how long does it generally take people to get a response from the ethics office? In your experience, is it a quick turnaround or is this something where you drop the question in and you wait for the, you wait a while? Thanks. No, no, it's no. a quick turnaround, no. especially for questions like this. It's a quick turnaround. So I was trying to get the um, to get the ethics office recommendation regarding the protest, you know, like during the George Floyd death, and I just found like an article on um, on foreign policy that may also be interesting, which also like show you how sensitive these kind of questions can be and how tricky it can also be for everyone. So I'm trying to get the um, the the official recommendation and advice from the ethics office on that point. Now, Jerome, do you want me to go yes. to the next question? Yes. What about yes. signing yes. an yes. open petition on a political issue if my status as a UN staff member is not mentioned and if the petition is consistent with the UN official position? Well, if it's if it's consistent with UN official position, I, I don't see a problem. But um, with the status as a UN staff member, it's a bit the same as in social media. Even if you don't appear as a um, official for the UN, it's fairly easy to find out that you are one. So that does not necessarily you know, protect you if you don't reveal your status as it is not, not private. How can you exercise tact and discretion and be effective in your activity involvement in the age of social media? Yep, yeah, it's it's a fine line. And um, as Kira said, in case of doubt, it, it's good to to ask for for advice. But as I said before, a good test is always. If I put something on social media, would it be also OK to say this in front of a journalist or in a public event? Would I call this out at the train station in, <laughs> in Geneva or in a restaurant? So I think this is always a good test. And if the answer is no, then it's definitely better to uh, to be cautious and not to post it. And as I said as well, I think very good indications are the speeches of the Secretary General as well of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, for example. They are quite active on uh, and social media. They do post a lot and as well the spokesperson. And I think this really gives us some good guidance what can be said and what cannot be said. Next question. Many senior UN officials have been high level government employees before joining the UN or they go back to uh, take up a role in their nation's government in their nation's government. How is this assessed by the UN as not having an impact on the person's impartiality? What the idea is and uh, what we all commit to when we start working for this organization is that we do leave our national passports and we really work for the United Nations. We are fully committed to to the work, to the standards and values, and we do no longer represent national interests. So this is really the responsibility of, of every one 
to to act like this, even in very difficult political situations as we are facing them at the moment. Kira? If I could just leap in here, Bettina, one of the points I think people may not be aware of is that everybody has to file a um, financial disclosure form. There's a, a financial disclosure thing we do. It's, it's D1s and above and people with certain responsibilities. But one of the things that we have to do in that is disclose any potential areas of conflict of interest. So for instance, uh, back in the day, I was a US Foreign Service officer. I certainly was not a high level government official, but nonetheless, I was actually a delegate. Every time I fill out that form, I sit and explain that from 1991 to this period, I was a you know US diplomat. So I put that in there and somebody does review that as part of the process. And if there are situations that are concerning, I assume that they would get back to you. I've never had anyone get back to that, but I thought it was an interesting detail for people to know that there is, there are mechanisms in place to try to capture some of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kira. Am I allowed to discuss political issues privately with my friends on WhatsApp? Yes, yes. It's uh, if it's private and it's your friends, and um, then that's okay. The same is true for political discussions, debate. You you do have privately, as we said. I mean, we. The freedom of expression <laughs> is also, uh, yeah, is a right we all enjoy uh, being a UN official or not, so that's okay. How about management's responsibilities towards subordinate staff? That's a very good question, Hassan. Yes, um, I think it's important that managers educate or at least tell their staff where they do find the information on, on these questions, in particular for the younger generation who is very, very active on, on social media. And I would say it does fall within the responsibility of managers to ensure that the team knows about these guidelines and the principles that apply. Let's see. Kira, do we have time to go through more questions or shall we then uh, go get back later on there? I see there are still many questions well, and they keep the, coming in. It, yes, let's let's, let's do this. Let's give it another 10 minutes and then that'll leave us 20 minutes for the SHP since much of the SHP will be very high level. I hope Ted and Casey that's not too concerning, but I think this is really about we really appreciate having your time. So. Um, I think okay. we should go ahead for another time. If the SAP colleagues don't get mad at us, <laughs> then. Um, and Jerome, please feel free huh, to to jump in as well and, and to take questions. So do you do you want to take the next one or? Bettina, it's fine if you want to continue. I mean, okay. I can take the next one. Okay, good. Then go ahead and I'll take the one after. So make it a bit more lively. So so which which one we, we so we were at like I'm, I'm allowed to discuss political issues privately with my friends. This on we WhatsApp. just covered, and then the next okay. one is from Jimmy. Is um, I'm feeling I, I'm feeling distressed for astrocytics occurring in many parts of the world through social media and sharing a personal opinion against the United Nations personal laws. Jimmy, I don't know if you want to uh, to explain what you exactly mean. Oh, we we don't have the possibility for live ah, chat. So okay. Either oh, okay, 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 or okay. just move on because we, we are yep, pushed I for think time. I'm going to move on good. with this one. Yeah, so if the SG takes a position on a particular human rights issue in a particular country, for example, are you saying that we could not endorse that position on social media, but should leave that to the SG? No, this you no. can endorse. No, um, that's why I said check what the SG is posting and everything he says of course there is no problem to endorse it it's even encouraged to do so uh, and to spread the message so what we said is that it's left to certain people within the organization for example the SG or heads of departments or the spokesperson to make statements to the press on sensitive issues so there's no problem to endorse, to like uh, what the SG um, posts on, on LinkedIn, for example. Even our friends whose job is, 
it is post make mistakes are really important to think twice yeah that's true yes, what absolutely. about international events caused by a specific government that are contrary to un values can we speak negatively in that case reminding you and val UN values yes i'm, I'm i mean we you're same hinting same, right? of course yes at the war in ukraine um for this i would also advise to see what um, high ranking officials are posting like the secretary general like the um, high commissioner for human rights who took a clear position that this was against the un values the charter as well and the charter yes what about a UN document or OHCHR press release which reports human rights violations or war crimes in a specific country? Can we share that on social media? If this is a public document, you can. If it's not a public document, you can't share anything which is not public on social media. So it, it depends, but if it's a public report, yes. Can we attend peaceful demonstrations on issues, but not demonstrations against a particular political regime? Do I have that right? Yeah, women's rights. From from my point of view, if it if it's something which is in line with our values, for example, women's rights, it's okay. But I I really to be caution as well and better to to wait for the advice of the ethics office. I also know noted that the UN ethics office often tends to have a bit of a more strict approach in comparison to some other international organizations. So um, I, I adv would advise here to to double check before attending such a demonstration. <laughs> no, no, we don't have the capacity to uh, to to answer uh, or to advise every time you want to to express your opinion. But there are just certain principles that need to to be respected. And as we said, freedom of expression, of course, is a very very high value. We all enjoy and of course you don't have to come back to us every time you you want to post something well i think it's important to be mindful to think before posting and to read these guidelines they're not very long it's two pages each and uh, they are very clear what what you can do and what you can't do can i just quickly leap in here i mean we've we've I think there's some more of these and we'll answer them as well. But one of the things I think would be useful just to wrap up, could you share a bit what the potential consequences are to people if they make a mistake in this regard? I think that's important. So there's a lot of points that are made here about principle. And again, you know, we do sign an oath and that does limit our freedom of action in certain ways. But I also think it's important for people to understand what the potential impact is if something comes right. I mean, and, and, and there's there's different shades of this, you know, depending yeah. on what's said, it can cast aspersions on the UN's reputation and we all could go back and dig back into things that were said immoderately, et cetera, and how those things get spun into misinformation or disinformation. But from the standpoint of if you as a staff member like something or post something, or make a public statement or a statement you don't think is public, but one of your friends videotapes and circulates, what can happen to the staff member? Just really a quick little proceed, and then we'll wrap this up and switch over to SHP. Thank you. Shalom, do you want me to take this one? No, please, so, please go. Yes, you can, so you can um, uh, then after so, we have... maybe starting with making a statement to the press or any other um, public statement. If there is no authorization, the STI is very clear on this. This may uh, represent misconduct and um, may there might be a disciplinary procedure which is initiated. So making a statement without prior authorization, but as well posting on social media um, content which is not um, in line with our status may represent misconduct. 
and may have as a consequence that disciplinary proceedings are initiated. It depends, of course, then on the gravity and as well whether, for example, the reputation of the organization was, was tarnished or not. Managerial actions are also a possibility. We just recently had a case where someone made a statement to the press. He gave an interview. He identified himself as a UN official. He did um, and he he pronounced himself on issues internal to the organization. So this was then forwarded to YOS. So it can have very severe consequences. At best, it's a reprimand. Um, in the worst case, it goes through a disciplinary procedure with then and ends with a sanction, um, which are yeah which are nominated in the in the staff rules. Excellent, thank you. So excellent, thank you very much for that. Um, I think that's really helpful. So I think I'd like to, I, you see you're the, the most popular part of our event. So thank you Jerome <laughs> and Bettina for joining us and for doing some live answers. We will, for questions that aren't answered, we will go ahead and take a look at that. I, I know this can be frustrating. It sometimes seems like things go in a big circle. Um, so, but I also felt it was really important to share the consequences. So it, it is worth taking the time and thinking about it because there can be very serious consequences for the UN in, in certain cases, but also for one personally. And the last thing any of us need is to be in a situation like that that happens unintentionally. So thank you very much, Jerome, Bettina. Let me now switch over to our colleagues from the SHP transition team. That would be Ted and Casey. So Ted, you have the floor, please go ahead. Ira, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I don't think I've gone live yet. Um, thank you very much, Kira, for that introduction. And um, Casey and I are delighted to be here. Um, we're going to get through this quite quickly. It is a very much a stuffed full turkey. Um, so um, hopefully we'll give you lots of information here. I'm going to do a high level view on the renovation work and the overall Palais moves and then the detail of the DCM moves later this year. Um, Casey's going to talk about transition activities, what to do to prepare for moves in the next steps. And online, we've also got Zenep, who can answer in writing um, any questions that you happen to put up on the Q&A. So we'll try and manage those as we're going along. Um, just as a few points, this is quite high level um, because many things may still change. Kira mentioned that there are still a number of uncertainties, and I shall also talk about those. Similarly, all of you are at different stages. Um, some of you have already moved, some of you are staying in place, some of you are going to temporary locations, some of you are going to final locations. Um, so Casey will give more details on the individual engagements that we're going to do to give you that sort of detail. I also want you to be aware that there is a new information circular just about to hit the streets that talks about space allocation process and uh, the, the amount of space allocation, the, 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 the guidelines for space allocation. Um, and finally, I also want you to be aware that because of GA mandates, um, the furniture in the renovated sections is either heritage or, or non-heritage stuff, but it is broadly the furniture that was there um, before the renovations were carried out. So those are just some introductory remarks. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, this is an overview of timings um, and it's a very rapid orientation. At the bottom of the slide, you can see a bird's eye view of the Palais. Um, and these are the different sections that we talk about when we talk about buildings um, being in renovation or not being in renovation. Um, and, and they are color coded as well to match what's at the top of the screen, which are the timelines. And I just want to spend a few moments talking about the timelines. You'll see three parts to it. One is a solid bar, which is the original plan of when the buildings would go into renovation or come out of renovation. You then see a little bit that's slightly paler color, and that's called P80. That's the 80% probability that the works will actually finish at that point. But that probability assessment was done a few weeks or a few months ago. And so there are now some revised P80s, which are shown as that blue arrow and, and the marker. So 
all of those you will see there is a degree of uncertainty about when these buildings will come out of renovation that's linked not only to covid and to a worldwide events but also the uncertainties of construction so what I'm trying to make clear is that the red line that you see there that's at the end of September and the beginning of October, which is notionally the time that all of the moves would be happening this autumn, that line may well shift by a month or more. We don't know exactly when, but this is the point I'm trying to make here that there is a degree of uncertainty on timings. Next slide, please. Um, and what I want to do here is talk about the moves that are going to be happening um, this autumn and to make the point that it's not just DCM that's being affected. Um, many parts of the Palais are coming back into use. Those are the parts that are in brown. Um, conversely, B and E and S2 are going to go into renovation. Critically, that means that building B and building E need to be emptied of staff and staff activities with very, very limited exceptions. So in big handfuls, the library, UNCTAD, ECE, DCM, and those who are temporarily in S2, such as JIU and OIOS and the Tribunal, they all need to move later this year. Now, the tent is to minimise moves and minimise overall hassle, but some people will have more hassle than others. It's a fact, some people will have to do two moves, uh, JIU have already done three, I think. So that's the overview. And now what I'm going to do very quickly is run through each section by section to show you where each of them are moving to. So if we can have the next slide, please, and these will go quite quickly. This is talking about language services. They are going to move from building E to all of building D, all six levels, and also to AC level two and AC level five, and that will be a final move for them. Next slide, please. This talks about the interpretation service and they are moving from E to level five of AB. And again, that is a final move. Next slide, please. Um, CPCS, the intention at the moment is that they will move out of B and they will go into level four of building H as a temporary move. Um, next slide, please. Uh, PSS, uh, two parts here. Firstly, the print shop stays in building E. It is deemed just too complicated to move it. So there will be special arrangements made for safe access there through the building site. The others, the staff members broadly in the offices will move from E into level four of building H again as a temporary move. Next slide, please. The office of the director um, will move from building E into S1, and that will be the final location next to the, the ODGs area. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, in terms of moves, uh, the meeting room assistants will move from E um, to building A, level four. And I confuse myself there because there is one more slide, please. Um, the uh, distribution center is going to move from building um, E into, next slide please, um, the distribution centre will move from building E into building C, but you may have noticed on the um, earlier timeline that building C is probably not going to be available until the first or the second quarter of next year. So there is still some work to be done there to determine exactly where the distribution centre will go. Um, and similarly, the innovation room still has to be settled as to where that will go. And there are some discussions to be had there. OK, that was a really, really quick run through all of the high level view of the SHP timelines, the overall moves in the autumn and then the separate moves that each service was going to do. Um, I will now hand over to Casey, so please put her live as quickly as we can and I'll keep talking uh, before she um, becomes live and we will, of course, take any questions in the chat. Casey, over to you. Thank you, Ted. Um, and I was going to say that while the slide was still up, but we I'll just mention that the distribution center, it will move. The C location will be temporary, but then once E opens back up, the distribution center will there will be two. So one will remain in C and also the permanent location in um, E as well. All right, so what is next? And 
part of the reason why we wanted to to join you today was to wave the flag a bit um, in terms of what was going on this year, despite the uncertainty of the dates, because it is still um, appropriate and um, we would we would hope that you take the opportunity to start preparing. Um, preparing your offices, preparing your archives, preparing the records. It's a lot of work to move. I'm sure all of you that have moved houses before know this. Um, many of you have been in the same office for quite some time, probably. This is what we've seen with the other entities that have moved. So um, it's really important to start early. And as, um, as Ted had mentioned, as the dates are a bit um, uncertain, we have this timeline for you and you see today we have this um, this information session that this brief presentation that we're doing for your town hall um, and then we have the the three months before two months one month and these are linked to your move date so for for IS and LS for example um, and based on the planning that was in the, the previous slide the really the earliest move date that could could be possible would be July and the latest move date based on the the, ri the risk and the probability estimates would be September. Um, for the other DCM services that are in building B and building E, it's it's really looking like um, in our in our in our view, um, it wouldn't be before November. Um, it, it might look officially different on the planning, but this is this is what we anticipate. So that's just to give you an idea of um, of when you you should be moving. And I know for some of you, it's quite a big range. So unfortunately, we don't have the certainty today to be able to give you the specific date. But as you see in this formal notification of move two months before the date, there will be a formal notification. And what's going on now is this micro planning and micro planning is what's done with SHP to really go into the details of who sits where, which team sits where, which individual sits in which office um, as in addition to determining storage requirements, uh, document uh, storage, for example, uh, other types of storage and really working going into the details of the space allocation. So this is an ongoing process. Uh, now and then we go to the formal move notification and we will also try in the month previous to the move to to make the spaces available to staff to be able to visit. It depends on the construction and the the um, the handover dates and there's some variables here, but we we like to do this um, so you can get an idea of what your future offices will will look like in future spaces. Then um, we also can do move related info sessions. So these are really specific to how to pack your boxes, how to, to get ready, met, all, answering all questions you might have about the, the move. And then after the move, some settling in sessions. You, you may think that the, the spaces that you're going into might be exactly like the previous spaces that you've been used to, but even for those who are going um, back into the same offices that you were in, there will be some differences and some changes. So this is to, to help you get used to your new working environments. Next slide, please. In terms of next steps, we have these different, um, we have different steps. So the, uh, the first thing is to take a good hard look at your offices and look in terms of what can be um, what you can get rid of, what needs to be archived, how to manage your records, and our library and archives in, in UNOG has a really great resource on iSeq. I'm going to put both of these on uh, both of these iSeq links now in the, the chat. Um, you can get in touch with them directly if you have questions, but they, they also have a training for records management focal points. So they're a, a fantastic resource if you do have questions in terms of how to manage your, your records and how to, to deal with them in pre-move. Then we have our team also and our iSeq pages, which um, where we have move related instructions. So if you're moving to building H, there's specific instructions for building H. If you're moving to the renovated palais, offices in the renovated palais, there's specific instructions for that, along with a whole set of other types of um, information. So this, I encourage you to, to check these, um, these two pages out and really to, to prepare yourself psychologically as well for, for the move. And lastly, 
we have a network of transition coordinators and um, right now we have about, about 115 across the, the Palais. We will be adding more from DCM. Um, LS already has, has nominated their transition coordinators and they have two per section, for example. Um, the other entities or other services within DCM will do the same. And I know that um, Kira has said that with the note of this town hall and the um, the message that goes out, she will also take the opportunity to announce the names and the contact information of these um, these transition coordinators. So what do they do? They really act as a two way conduit of information between our team and SHP with your your teams and to help prepare all of the team members for for the move to work through the logistics with everybody and then to ask questions um, and share information. So we this has been a really successful uh, best practice that we've we've established and has um, has worked quite well in our previous in the previous moves that we've done. So we are sure that it will work just as well with um, with DCM. Uh, I guess we go to the questions now and this is our last slide for us. So thanks very much. Um, Ted, I don't know how if we answer the questions in the chat or I see we only have nine minutes left. I think thanks so much, Casey and Ted, right. Ted and Casey. I think we can take the presentation down, um, but let's go ahead and if you could just do some live answering while we have a chance. And then if there's still a little bit, a few more minutes, then we can of course circle back. And if there's any additional questions or additional comments, Jerome and Bettina want to make. But if you could go ahead and, and answer the questions I see, I'm just looking to see here, uh, what is the timeline for language service to move to buildings D and AC? So Zainab has answered that. I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to that. Um, so Ted, I see you've answered the other, the printing question, then there's also building E, there's a comment. Okay, so here we are working for the... Uh, Maybe you could put Kira on live since she's been talking for a while. I think I'm still, the oh, live yeah, is sorry. still on me. Sorry. <laughs> I can, I can tell you're a veteran of this since you're aware of uh, waiting for it to switch over. There we go. OK, so let's go ahead and um, I see there's a few questions have already been answered. Some of them are not. Um, just a few things I just want to reiterate. Just as a reminder for much of the depart of the division, these are temporary moves. So for instance, language service, there will be an additional moves once the building C work is done. Um, as was mentioned, PSS will go back once it came, CPCS. This. So in general, these will be temporary moves. This is an opportunity for people to, um, I know this is going to be hard, right? So first of all, let me just say this is hard. I appreciate the great work of Casey and Ted in trying to make this as straightforward as possible, but it is going to be complicated. And I do recognize that for many people, what they'll be moving to is not necessarily as nice as what they have now. Um, and that I know is frustrating individually, but that's we. I think it's worth acknowledging that yes, for some people, their individual circumstance may not be as nice as it is right now. I think that's worth mentioning. This is an opportunity if people wish to do things a little bit differently. For instance, we had a meeting with the language service chiefs. Uh, one of the things that's gonna be different for language service staff is that the DPUs, formerly known as the typing pools, that's very retro, um, but the desktop publishing units are actually going to be co-located as a pilot project. So we'll see how that works out over a certain period of time. Uh, some of the, especially the language, some of the language staff will be in shared offices. I know CPCS is going to be in uh, H building. H building, which you see behind Ted and Casey, is a very much open plan. So that will be a change. Um, one of the things that we've thought about in the context of shared offices is we have to see whether or not perhaps we could make some adjustments to teleworking. Maybe it might be possible for people in really big shared offices, and I'm thinking about translators who need to work in a very quiet, focused environment. Perhaps we could make it so that they could telework up to four days a week. Um, this will, especially since many people who have individual offices now, will in fact be switching to shared offices. This is a core precept of the SHP. This, as I, and maybe Ted, you'll clarify this, but as I understand, this wasn't our choice, but that uh, all staff, all D1 staff and above have individual offices, but staff below that, when they're establishing the space count, it's um, everybody is to be sharing. So there are some overarching principles for SHP, 
But again, much of this will be temporary. So hopefully we can come to it with the spirit of let's see if how this works and then lessons learned so that when people move to their final setting, um, we'll be able to optimize that as much as possible. So maybe Ted, I don't know if you want to add any comments on that. And I see also that our Slido poll is continuing to not work. I regret the inconvenience. Um, we'll send it out again later, but that seems not to work. But Ted, over to you. We wait for it to go live because I'm not never sure whether people can hear until we are going live. Um, so I shall keep talking for a few moments. Um, and to go any, if you could make me live, that would be very much appreciated. I think we've um, addressed. Uh, OK, I think we've addressed most of the questions um, it, with, with written answers as, as we've gone through. Um, and this is not an ideal forum to have a sort of two, two way discussion on things. I really would recommend that much of the detail that people are asking here is probably best kept for the, the service level or even lower level uh, meetings that we can have. And of course, as Casey said, you know, the transition team is always available and SHP team is always available to answer the detailed questions. I think there is one concern or one issue being raised about space allocations. So let me just talk about that briefly. In addition to what Kira has said, uh, there is a new information circular about to come out, which broadly reflects the space allocation principles in place in New York. Um, it is a little bit more generous than the ones in New York, but it broadly reflects them. That then is how the SHP divides up the areas in the Palais and allocates them to different sections based on the numbers of staff that they have and therefore the space that they require. How that space is then used within the service or within the section is broadly up to that service or section. So without being silly, if the uh, if the service decides to have um, all of the P5s and P4s in single offices and throw 20 interns into a, into one separate office, then that is for the service to do and manage themselves within the overall space that they are allocated. So that is down to local management to, to manage. Uh, there's also been a question asked, I think, about when the uh, when services will actually know that they are moving, and I think that has been answered. We are under remit to give you at least two months clear notice of the time that you will move. There's also a question on there about do you have to do your own packing and your own moving? Um, the moving, no, you don't do that because that is down to professional movers who will manage that. Um, in terms of the packing, yes, you do have to do that yourselves. And again, this will be gone into in more detail, but fundamentally you get two boxes. They're sort of that size by that size, two boxes um, for your personal stuff, an unlimited number of boxes for office stuff, so in use records and things like that. And then archives and other things are treated separately as are physical things like uh, pull up screens and, 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 and stores like that. That will all be discussed in more detail uh, when we have individual engagements. But fundamentally, you pack your stuff, you pack the office stuff and then the movers move it for you. Mindful of the time, I think I'm probably best to hand back to Kira at this stage um, and we will happily take any answers offline um, or in person. Uh, Kira, back to you, I think. Great. Thanks so much, Ted. Um, let me very much thank again. Thank Ted and Casey. Go back. Also thank Jerome and Bettina and uh, Nicholas and um, Sadia, his colleague. So and of course, all of you we have. We're still at 238 attendees. That's very impressive, especially when it's, um, you know, a Tuesday afternoon and it's a lovely day outside. But thank you for spending an hour, um, an hour and a half with us. Let me apologize for the technical glitches. Bettina had some some issues sound wise and such. And then we've had this problem with the poll, which is, is frustrating um, because we do try to take advantage of when everyone gets together to gather some information. We'll send around um, the link to that after the fact. Again, apologies and we'll try to understand what happened. Um, if you have additional questions and you didn't have a chance to put them in the chat, feel free to send them to the office of the director. Move specific questions about SHP may be better addressed to your leave coordinator. We will be a uh, move coordinator, excuse me. We will be circulating those names. If you have your question now and you want to add it, again, office of the director, or you could ask your admin assistant in your service and they will, um, if they can answer already, they will, otherwise they will get it to us. 
But thank you very much for your time. Um, one of our polls is we did want to ask if uh, we were planning on having a summer party in, in June. This is kind of a return to a tradition that Corinne had started, which I think is, uh, is a very good one. It would be an outdoor event. So we'll include in the poll what time people would prefer, whether they would prefer to have it at lunch, because of course that doesn't then interfere with your personal life where you may have made arrangements to pick up your children or you have to get home at a certain time or whether we want to do it late in the afternoon, which of course has a whole different vibe. So we'll see what the general interest is on that. Um, again, thank you very much. In regards to the SHP, I do know that this is going to be a complicated uh, move for everybody. Uh, it's going to be a process. It'll go on for a while. I too will be moving, um, but that's how it goes. And um, so we'll be doing more. There'll be much more information about the SHP moves. Um, regarding the situation with uh, social media and speaking in public, et cetera, I know that also can be quite frustrating because it would be nice if something were very clear. One of the things we've seen is if there's a lot of questions about a particular thing, ethics office will send out some guidance. Um, I know we don't necessarily want to swamp Bettina and Jerome, but again, I would still enjoin people. If you if you actually have doubts, then I would if don't send it to Bettina or Jerome. You can send it straight to the ethics office. I've never heard them say I've never heard any feedback from them saying we don't have time for this because that's what they do. And um, it can be quite serious. And, and I know we all want to support the organization to the best possible. Um, but there are mechanisms in place to help us to understand what the gray areas, how they work out in our particular situation. And again, I endorse the Ombudsman service fully and wholeheartedly. If you're finding yourself in a difficult situation, you're frustrated, you've discussed with your manager or you have a conflict with a colleague, you've tried to get help, you can't sort it out. And certainly if it's keeping you up at night, uh, hopefully it doesn't get to that stage. Please get in touch with them. Um, they're outstanding professionals and they really can help make a difference um, in resolving situations because, you know, it's the more it's great. The organization provides resources to help with that. So thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and um, we really appreciate it. So take care. Thank you.